votes and revotes, deal or new deal. We take a look at what it all means and how it all went down. We'll break down the process of Connecticut's deal with the unions. A former state rep with national experience is here to say how she sees it. Also, a troubling number of foreclosures continues in Connecticut. We're going to hear about some last-minute help for desperate homeowners. This is The Real Story. I'm Lori Perez. The past few months have given us all a front row seat to the give and take tug of war negotiations between the state of Connecticut and its union member state workers. From the historic series of town hall meetings hosted by the governor and the ever present union in the crowd to the complicated rejection of the first savings and concessions deal, all of it has been an anxious drama, not only for union members, but for every resident in the state who uses state services, which is pretty much everyone. Our first guest is someone who knows a lot about politics and the force of unions both. Chris Niedermeyer is a former state rep who served as co-chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Collective Bargaining. She was also co-author of the Rainy Day uh, Fund that we hear so much about nowadays. Thanks, for, Chris, for being here. You're welcome. Thanks. I guess um, as a matter of background, let's just start off with um, your work in the state legislature on collective bargaining, um, what you did. and. and that. Well, back in the 80s, the scenario was, was entirely different. Back then, the salary levels of state employees were far trailing the, the private sector. And so the mentality in state government among both parties from time to time over those last couple of decades was that the only way that we could be competitive with the private sector, or one of the easiest ways we could, was to increase benefits, be that pension benefits or health care benefits. And so over time, while salaries started to increase uh, on the public side, benefits benefits mushroomed. For example, when, when Governor Rowland was governor um, back in 1997, he adopted a pension plan that, with a 20-year payout that went unfunded, but it was a way of sweetening the deal and the pie so that state employees would not leave for the private sector. It's interesting that you say that because now the perception, I mean, right or wrong among at least private sector workers, is that salaries of state workers are so inflated and the pensions are um, so generous. Well, well that's, that hits the nail on the head, Lori. Because what's happened over time is those salaries have come up and in many cases are competitive, if not in some areas, in some segments, higher than the, the private sector. And so now you have state workers with very generous pension benefits and health care benefits and very generous salaries. And on top of that, the state has been funding a lot of these through band-aids in, in the state budget, and now we're, we're, we've been paying the price with gimmicks and band-aids for the last 15 to 20 years. Well, now what we're hearing is that some of the concerns about people who did vote against this first savings and concessions deal is about um, the changes to the health care package, and also they had some concerns about um, changes to their retirement benefits. I mean, are those... Uh, I mean, what do you? I mean, do you think, as a former lawmaker, I mean, do you think it was a good deal? What what he's been offering them? Or? I think the first deal was a very good deal in this climate, and the reason I say that is, in the private sector, um, many many companies have had layoffs. The unemployment rate in Connecticut is nine point one percent. To have a four year guarantee of no layoffs, to have a two-year freeze of, of salaries, but then 3%, three years in a row, of increases, a 9%, given the climate, just given the climate. I mean, our state workers are very hard workers. They do yeoman service, many of them, and so I don't undermine the value of their service. But given this economic climate, given the tremendous $3.5 billion deficit the state was facing, given the $1.5 billion in tax increases, there needed to be, as the Governor Malloy said, shared sacrifice. So why did this happen then? I mean, what... what I mean, surely state workers are well-informed people. They should have known that that was the scenario. Well, you know, some have said to me, it depends on where you come from at this. If you are a state employee who's been there a number of years and in their 50s, you may not want to vote for a package that increases the retirement age just as you're approaching the existing retirement age. Right. And yet the 55-year retirement age in state government is far more generous than in, in the uh, private sector. Um, the sustenance issues are very complex, and I won't pretend to be an expert in those, but, but private sector large corporations have started to lean toward having requirements that employees go once a year for 
checkups mm -hmm. and twice a year for dental checks and if they fail those to go into a special management pool where you're given services to try to increase and improve your health and if you don't and you refuse to go for those tests or you continue to fail them your premiums would go up and I believe this is part of the plan and there has been some misunderstanding about it and 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 let's face it it's easier to give benefits than to take them away and I can see the state employee side because when you're given all these benefits and when you feel like your axe is being gored every time there's a budget crisis and the state takes yeah. back benefits, you know, they have, they're in the middle in, in part of what has been created both by the recession and by the practices of past legislatures and governors. You know, Gov Governor Malloy inherited this. He didn't create this, but he is trying to address it. Do you think that there were missteps on, on either part of, of the administration or the union? that could have prevented or could have gotten the deal initially well, passed? Or? You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. When I look back, what I, what I think is that you know, part of the problem was we had a new governor coming in, trying to grapple with the financial picture. Mm -hmm. The budget was proposed in February. From what I understand, his staff did not sit down to meet with the unions first time until the beginning of, of March. So already you're two months through the legislature. Mm -hmm. You've got a reporting deadline of the first Wednesday in June. And it took an awful long time to come to an agreement. So had they maybe sat down right after the election yeah. knowing they were facing this and had the union leaders been able to to come up with some agreement earlier and had they had that frankly I am in the camp with those who believe that perhaps we should have never passed the state budget until we had a complete budget because without the state budget it would have put pressure on all parties to come to an agreement now we have chaos because the budget has gone into effect and yet we don't have a complete budget you have people who are getting layoff notices and people who are getting salary increases and that all may change if this new deal is approved so just to be clear so if they had not passed it what would be what would be different now well if they didn't pass it in june and kept the pressure they gave the unions about a month to approve this mm -hmm. now understandably there are fifteen unions there are many many bargaining units and and many even smaller unions within that so it was a lot of people to get the word out to i guess there are forty five thousand yeah. state employees some say fifty thousand when you count part-time people only about thirty four thousand voted on the first deal so even with that month so it's you're kind of between a rock and a hard place you know mm -hmm. they didn't have a lot of time to deal with it but perhaps if we hadn't the legislature hadn't passed the budget at the beginning of June there would have been pressure on all sides to say we need to get something because the new budget's going into effect July 1st and we need to approve something by the end of end of June there were some who expected that this was going to be easier because of the Democratic governor the first Democratic governor in 20 years I mean was that a false expectation or, or should it have been easier well you know it, I, I'm not sure it was easier because the problems were enormous but I, I'm not sure that Governor Rell or Governor Rowland would have even gotten this far with any of the unions. Um, Nancy Wyman, Lieutenant Governor, has a very good relationship with yeah. the unions. Obviously, Governor Malloy did. Uh, Marco Jakian, who did a lot of the negotiating, the deputy at OPM, and Ben Barnes to some extent as well, um, are very smart, are very capable, and, and have good relationships with the unions. I just think that the unions are diverse and they have different interests and you have a couple of smaller unions who won't buy onto anything so and having an eighty percent approval that was really a stumbling block there aren't too many institutions where you need eighty percent approval so even though they had eleven of i believe fifteen unions who approved it they didn't and fifty seven percent voted for it they didn't have eighty percent and now of course the rules have changed right right and we'll talk about that coming up chris is going to stick around but we know that connecticut is far from the only state wrangling with its unions coming up we're going to talk a little bit about the battle with unions perhaps across the nation.